The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your home with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Beth, uh, Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord, and invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him here, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose and went up to Ramah. Blessing to the word of the Lord. I'm uh, pretty excited about finally getting to the rise of King David because, <laughs> because we have for so long been bearing with Saul as Saul has been degenerating into sin and sin and sin and sin. And so <laughs> I've been just waiting to get here um, because the scriptures are going to be happier from, <laughs> from this point. We get a happier message. Um, the same challenge that scripture always comes with, uh, the same conviction that the word of God always brings with it. Uh, but we get to see the rise of David, uh, the type of Christ, uh, the one who would sit on Christ's throne, uh, the one through whom Christ's true throne in Israel would be prepared. And we get to begin David's story today. Uh, before we jump into David's story, let's pray together and uh, just ask, ask for our Lord's blessing on, on the study of his word. Lord, we want to thank you so much for everything you do. We want to thank you for your sovereign hand in all things. We want to thank you for your providence. We want to thank you for your miracles. We want to thank you for the joy that we get to have in the Christian life. We want to thank you for grief when we experience grief. We want to thank you for hardship. And Lord, we want to thank you for, for sometimes handing us over to our sinful desires because that's how we grow closer in our relationship with you. That's how we are sanctified. So we thank you for those things because they, those things build us into more mature people. As we come to your word, Lord, we ask you to open up our eyes. Give us ears to hear. Give us minds that understand something, something about you. Lord, through the reading and through the study of your word, give us hearts that yearn after you. Not after our own selfish ambition, and not after the w way we think things 
ought to be, but just after you, plain and simple. Let us fall in love with you again this morning and tomorrow morning and the next morning and the next. Let us come to love you and not anything less. And Lord, we do, we love you. That's why we are here, to learn from your word. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You hear the word, and we hear it often because this thing is happening all the time, and we can't stop it no matter how hard we try. And in some circles, it's a really, really bad word, and <laughs> change. You know? um, and no matter how we try and stop it, change always seems to come. Change always seems to happen. Right. Change is happening in, in this story. We're transitioning from Saul's reign to David's reign. This is a change that's taking place. And we're going to see uh, how David's reign is characteristically different from Saul's reign. I mean, the whole kingdom of Israel is just going to look different during David's reign than it does during, during Saul's reign. And as we read through this text, we're, we're just going to see how God, God's forward motion works through time and how God really is working all things together, uh, not according to any preference of any person, uh, not according to the, the morals that we convince ourselves to, to have, and not, a, not according to the way we think things ought to be or should be, not according to the things that we love, but according to His purpose and according to his plan and according to his own design, which in, in the context of First Samuel, he is preparing Christ's throne within Christ's creation. And so that's the purpose God is working out here. And we're going to see how people, even godly people, tend to focus on so much less than where God is going. And so we get, we get kind of stuck rather than being willing to follow God where God is is going. And this is uh, where chapter 16 starts for us. Now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve? This is verse 1. In verse 35 of chapter 15, we see Samuel grieving over Saul because Saul rejected God's word. Just outright disobedience to God, degeneration into sin, um, falling uh, from the grace of God. God appointed him to kingship. And, and, and Saul, he just continued, even though he was trying as best he could to, to work for some sort of acceptance, for some sort of victory, he digressed into sin and into sin and into sin. And God, as God is communicating through Samuel to Saul, communicating the fact that Saul is no longer king, that God has already chosen someone else to be king over Israel. We see in chapter uh, 15 that God himself grieved God himself grieved, and in, in like manner, Samuel is grieving over Saul because of Saul's rebellion against God, because, because he rejected the word of God when God gave instruction to him. Now, we're going to notice something different here about when God experiences emotion and when people experience emotion. God grieved over Saul, same as Samuel is grieving over Saul here. God grieved over Saul in the appropriate time. At the time of mourning and at the time of grief, God did that within time itself, temporally. Samuel, when he grieves, it's difficult for Samuel to let go and move forward. So God grieves, but God, within time, moves forward. And this is difficult to think about because God is he's outside of time. He's eternal. He is timeless. But somehow within his creation, as he interacts and responds to his creation, he experiences grief and happiness, sadness, joy. He experiences these things as he lives dynamically with his creation, interacts with his creation. But at the appropriate time, he experiences the grief and, and moves on and moves forward. Samuel here gets stuck in his grief, and, and God asks Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? This is what I am working out, Samuel. I have rejected Saul 
I am working it out that Israel will have a new king. I am working this out. How long will you grieve and how long will you be stuck in your grief over Saul, O Samuel? Now I recognize that grief is something difficult to talk about. Because many of us in different ways experience grief and many of us know just how difficult it is to actually move past grief, right? We would say, impossible, <laughs> impossible for me to move past certain types of grief, especially the loss of a loved one, someone who is very, very, very close to us. It's just... It's so difficult to overcome that grief. In fact, when I talk with Katie about it, you know, we, we lost a son last year. And Katie had a miscarriage, and that, that impacts the husband and wife alike. And the wife, in many ways, it affects her more than it does the husband, because the husband's not carrying the child. And we talk about this, and it's like, I don't think it's ever actually possible for someone to overcome that type of grief. Right? I don't actually think it's possible for someone to overcome it. Yet, in Scripture, we see God asking Samuel to move forward. And it's, it's not that Samuel necessarily overcomes or claims victory over grief. But it is that in the appropriate time, Samuel is able to grieve. And then, with God's help or by God's direction, right? God's working all things together, is able to then move forward with the plan of God and with the direction that God has for his life. Now, I'm proud to say here at the Church of Sunsites, if you struggle with grief, and the struggle is so deep that you just can't, you can't even, we have a grief share program to help with that, and it's, it's very good. Priscilla is sitting right over here. She runs our grief share program, and if you need help through grief, talk with her. Get plugged into that ministry because it is a good ministry and the material is biblical and it is on point. Um, it is so good. I'm proud to say that we have that here. And when we look at this verse, I, I think that we often get stuck in more things than merely grief. Um, more things than grief hold us back from really following hard after God, after, after Christ. Uh, in First Samuel so far, uh, what have we learned about the sovereignty of God, about God's sovereignty? Well, He is sovereign, right? In fact, you look at, you look at Romans chapter 10, and the, the very first confession of the Christian is what? Christ is Lord. That means we recognize He is in charge of all things. There is nothing that is outside of Christ's kingly domain. He is Lord. And that's a statement of sovereignty, the sovereignty of, of Jesus Christ, uh, the, the second person of the Godhead. And so we believe as Christians, biblical Christianity states that God is sovereign over all things. And what about God's providence? Um, who works together all things for His own glory and for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. And that would be God, right? And so we take this statement, how long will you grieve over Saul? And we can, we can use our reasoning skills, our inductive reasoning, and, and we can arrive at this amazing truth that if God really is working all things together, then by getting stuck in the past the way things used to be, if I say that I would prefer things be this way instead of the way that they are, if I claim that I do not like the way things are because I don't perceive that this is the way things ought to be, that is one of the most definite ways that we can mock the one who actually works all things together. Because things are, are not the way that they are by accident. And new things don't happen by accident, and old things don't pass away by accident. God really is working all things together. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 9, says this, The former things have come to pass. This reveals something to us about God's nature. The former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things. This is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah. Now I declare new things. Before they spring forth... 
I proclaim them to you. There, God takes direct responsibility for new things that happen, and God takes direct responsibility when old things have passed away. Whether we perceive those things as positive or negative on either side, God is the one who takes direct responsibility for causing those things. God is the causal agent here. And the Bible is clear about this. Now, someone listening who has just done a really cool Bible study in Ecclesiastes will say, now wait a minute, preacher. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9 says that there is nothing new under the sun. How do we reconcile those two things? If God in the scriptures takes direct responsibility for within the context of time, temporally causing new things to happen, but is also inspired in his scripture, the statement, there is nothing new under the sun. How do we begin thinking about this work that God is doing where old things are passing away and new things are coming? Is that even possible? Why isn't existence just static? Why do we live in such a dynamic world where culture is changing, where churches change, where families change, where people change if there is in fact nothing new under the sun. Here I just want to take the opportunity to remind us about context. Right? Last week we saw that context goes in two directions. First of all, if we're studying the scriptures, we have to know the context to know what any author in scripture means. We have to know the context of the verse. And so we have to know the context of Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9. And the same goes living in our current culture, living in our community. We live in a context. And so the Word of God must be communicated in a way that people understand. And, and we serve people according to needs that they have. And we identify with people because, because that's how the gospel propagates through the people of God. There is nothing, nothing that surprises God. Our, our, our community isn't filled with the people our community is filled with. By accident, God has worked that together for his good purpose. And he has placed us here for his good purpose. We read Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And we won't turn there and read the whole chapter right now. Write it down, bookmark it, look at it later. And just be sure that I'm right about this. Because this is actually kind of cool to think about. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, when Solomon writes that there is nothing new under the sun, he is referring specifically to the laws of nature after the creation of the sun. Nothing new under the sun, which means after the sun is created, the laws of nature are set in place. No, there's nothing new about the laws of nature. What God speaks, the laws that God speaks, they do not change because God speaks truth and only truth. And so when God creates the laws of physics, those laws of physics do not change because, because what God speaks is final, right? Right? God created the universe the way that he has created it for his glory, for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. The second thing that Solomon is referring to in chapter 1 of Ecclesiastes is human vanity, human selfishness under the sun, which means since the time the sun was created, which means even Adam and Eve had these problems, <laughs> which is kind of crazy for some of us to think about, right? And he's getting at people created in the image of God are not God, which means there's some quality God has that people never had. They just had the image of that quality, and that is righteousness, holiness. And if God is the only righteous one, people are created in his image. That means people have within them the image of righteousness, not, not righteousness itself. Which means that this vanity that Solomon is writing about in Ecclesiastes, this self-centered, works-based religion, can even be seen in the lives of Adam and Eve. And we do see it. As soon as God gives a command, what happens? Well, people decide they're going to try and work to prove that they are righteous. And the same thing that was wrong with Adam and Eve is the same thing that's wrong with us. And we all, we all transgress God's holy, perfect, good Law And he gives that law for the purpose of showing us that we are unrighteous. So the laws of nature and human vanity they do not change. We are unrighteous by nature. And it is why we must have the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit to be considered to have the righteousness of God and not a righteousness that is of our own. We could, this morning, read the entire book of Ecclesiastes. <laughs> 
But instead of reading the whole book of Ecclesiastes, I just basically summarized chapter 1, and I will read from Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, as Solomon is closing out his argument, as his letter. The conclusion, when all has been heard, is fear God and keep His commandments. Because this applies to every person. Every person, vanity, self-centered living, self-centered religion. This applies to every person. So fear God and keep His commandments. For God will bring, God will do something new according to the book of Ecclesiastes. It's like the whole Bible agrees. For God will bring every act into judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. And so we just make this statement about change, the fact that we live in a dynamic world with dynamic cultures and churches and the fact that our lives are so dynamic that we can honestly say we have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. We have no idea what we are doing is a true statement because we don't know, we can't often see the things that God is working together for our good and for His glory alone. What can be said about change is this, is that we strive to move forward with God as God works all things together for His glory and our, and our good. And we strive to fear God and keep His commandments. This applies to every, every person. When that is not our focus, we do get wrapped up in vanity and self-centered living, self-centered religious practice. And we find ourselves, instead of rejoicing about what God is doing and will do in the future, and, and instead of being you know, filled and exuberant with the Holy Spirit and being, being happy with one another living in community, we, we're, we're like Samuel, who was, was just stuck in his grief. How long will you grieve over Saul? Since I have rejected him from being king over Israel... Fill your horn. Instead of grieving, instead of being stuck in your grief, it doesn't mean don't be sad about what Saul did. It means I want you to follow me. Instead of being stuck in your grief, fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have selected a king for myself among his sons. Samuel, God says, I have a plan. You don't have to get stuck in your grief. You don't have to get stuck in the past. You can trust that I am working all this together. In fact, I have already selected, I have already chosen a king for myself. Go anoint this king. My plan will move forward because I have declared that it will. And God does this and he works this. I have found in my own life, in my own ministry even, everything I try and work together fails. And I get, <laughs> yeah, and I get frustrated about it. God, why did you? <laughs> I get frustrated about it. And every time God is like, son, you have no idea what I'm working together. And I am doing it for my glory. So son, just focus on, just focus on doing what I want you to do. Because I promise it'll turn out way better than anything you could try and work together. Right? Uh, we have no idea what we are doing. <laughs> Let's just follow Christ. But Samuel said, how can I go? Samuel, the prophet of God, now questions God. Now this, Samuel is, he's like God's chosen man to bring the word of God. None of Samuel's words will fail according to what we've already read in 1 Samuel. Yet he questions God. He's the best of us, yet he questions God. This is just human tendency. Even the best of us, which includes me and our other elders and our deacons and everyone sitting here, the best of us, we will question God. Samuel said, how can I go? When Saul hears of it, he will kill me. He's, he's fearing the consequences. Future conse consequences. He doesn't know for sure this will happen. He's dreaming up. What about all the things that could possibly go wrong? Oh, Saul could kill me. That's a big one. How, how, how can you work this together, God? How can I go? When Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. You shall invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. 
and you shall anoint for me the one whom I designate to you. And so Samuel, he looks forward in time. Samuel's foresight, human foresight, right? We don't have that great a foresight. Like I said, we have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. Samuel looks forward to what he thinks the possibilities are for his future, and he says, I fear the consequences here. And we do that. We try and figure it out, don't we? What if we don't have enough money? <laughs> what about the danger that lies ahead? What will people think about me? How will my reputation suffer? How will my ministry suffer? How will my life suffer? What will happen to my family? I have a nice job, and I really don't want to lose that job. What if I, what if I do what God is directing me to do and I lose my job and I'm not able to provide anymore. We fear future consequences. We worry about future consequences. What if, because we dedicate ourselves to preaching the Word of God alone, everybody leaves the church at sunsets like everybody left Christ? What if that happens? And God's answer is simple. I'm giving you a way to do what I'm calling you to do. Do not fear the future consequences. And he tells Samuel how he should go forth. And he, Samuel here is to be prudent. He really is going to sacrifice. It's not like God is instructing Samuel to lie. He's really going to sacrifice. And God says, be as sly as a serpent, as innocent as a dove. Go. I want you to go. Go. And don't worry too much about future consequences, right? Because you're seeing those future consequences according to your own wisdom and not God's wisdom. Go and do this. And anoint for me the one whom I designate to you. Verse 4. Uh, in verses 1 through 3, we saw that God is moving His plan forward. With or without us, God is moving His plan forward. We saw that we often will not want to move forward with God. That's human nature. It's the way that we are, because we are unrighteous and God is righteous, but God moves His plan forward. In verses 4 through 11, we'll see that God, God thinks differently than we do. His plans are not ours. Look at me in verse 4. So Samuel did what the Lord said and came to Bethlehem, and the elders of the city came trembling to meet him and said, Do you come in peace? Samuel is God's seer. <laughs> he is God's prophet. Often when he traveled to speak, God had a reason, and that reason was often punishment, <laughs> right? A declaration against the people, a testimony against the people because they had done... Do you come in peace is a valid question when God's seer is coming, specifically to Bethlehem, the this, this small place. He said, in peace, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. He also consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Samuel still doesn't know who God is going to anoint. He still doesn't know. He steps out, we would phrase it this way, he steps out in faith. And what we mean by that is he stepped out, even fearing the consequences, Samuel stepped out and trusted that God would provide, that God would lead him precisely where God wanted to go so that God's plan and God's purpose would be fulfilled. He stepped out in faith. I think the call to us is much the same. We have no idea where the road we're on leads practically. Uh, we have no idea what God is going to do tomorrow, next, next Sunday, or within the next year here at the church at Sunsites, or in our lives, in our families, in our homes, in our workplaces. We, don't, we just don't know. And here we see this amazing example in Scripture where God's prophet, the one who sees, the seer, does not know what God is going to do, who God has chosen, yet he follows God anyway. Verse 6, when they entered, he looked at Eliab, the, Jesse's oldest son, 
Now, all the sons are going to come in procession before Samuel, and he's going to select which son God has chosen. Eliab comes, and Samuel thinks, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. <laughs> all right, <laughs> stop there. The oldest son, son of Jesse, Iliab, even as a cool, like, strong name, Iliab, a strong man because he's in a strong family, a fighting family, a shepherd family. And this guy probably fends off wild animals for a living. Oh, no, probably there. He does fend off wild animals for a living. And he's the oldest son. Of course, this is who, of course, this is who God would choose as king. But the Lord said to Samuel, verse 7, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I have rejected him. Oh, okay. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We try our best to make judgment calls all the time about all sorts of things. And we try and figure out in our minds, this is what God wants. Surely this is what God wants. And whatever it is, right, we can apply this to any situation, any, any circumstance. I think God would like this. And the answer we receive from Scripture when we do that, when, when we make judgment calls for our own lives, when, when we try to make you know, specific, very specific plans, when we try and choose what we're going to do, when we try to hold on to whatever it is that we like, and when we try to gain whatever it is that we think we will like, God's answer is this. You, all you see is outward appearance. You don't have the ability to look at the human heart. You don't have the ability to see the, the, the real, the nature of things as I have created them, as I have set them in motion according to my plan. You don't have this ability because you are not God. God thinks about things differently than Andrew Cannon thinks about things. And this is humbling for me because I see myself as a pretty smart guy. I, and I see many of you as just really intelligent people. And yet when it comes to this, like everybody is on equal ground because none of us can see. None of us think like God thinks. None of us have eyes to see like this. We, we can't make judgment calls like God makes judgment calls. And here God tells us flat out, outright, man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Well, plain and simple. And he doesn't qualify that. He just says, this is matter-of-factly true. Samuel, stop trying to figure this out. I will show you who to choose. And for us, it's God saying, I will show you which direction to go. I will show you, you know, which church you need to attend. I will show you how I want you to preach my scriptures. I will show you. Stop worrying about the future. Stop trying so hard to, f to figure your own life out because I really do have a plan for you. I am working your whole life together for my glory and for the good of those who love me and are called according to my purpose. The Lord looks at the heart. Verse 8, Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Okay. Next, Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. <laughs> All right, God, what are you doing here? Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And that was all the children who were present there. <laughs> like, this is everyone here, Lord. Uh, everyone that Jesse brought to the sacrifice, um, all of the worthy candidates, they're here. And you said no to all of them. What are you doing? And Samuel said to Jesse, are these all the children? Is, it, is this everybody? Did you, is this everybody that you brought to the sacrifice? And he said, there remains yet the youngest. And behold, he is tending 
and the sheep. He, he was not worthy to be here with you, O oh, seer. We, we, we needed the one who wasn't worthy to, to tend the sheep while us, the important people, while we met with you. Right? He was tending the sheep. And then Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him. For we will not sit down until he comes here. Sit down there, a reference when people would sacrifice, the sacrifice of thanksgiving. They would partake of the sacrifice. They would eat. We will not sit down and eat of the sacrifice until the youngest comes. We see that God's way of doing things, his way of thinking about things, isn't like ours at all. Yet we always seem to find a way to question how things are. And to condemn, uh, you know, we, st- we said this a little bit last week, to condemn what's going on in the political world, to condemn what's going on socioeconomically, to, to complain about the, the bad, terrible, immoral things that, are, that, that people are doing outside the walls of the, the proverbial church. Um, that's, the, that's the tendency of the human heart, the bending of the human heart. And God's response is, you are only looking at the outside. And you are incapable of seeing things for what they truly are. Trust me, son. Trust me, daughter. I know what I'm doing. I know what I am working together. For my glory and, if we belong to Christ, for our good. Which means we can be joyful no matter what's happening in the world, what's happening in the church, what changes are taking place anywhere. And that's simply called contentment. We find contentment when we trust in our Father, Christ. Verses 12 and 13, we're just going to take a moment and introduce King David. Ladies, don't get too excited here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, rugged. He was a rugged man. A rugged man with beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. He was a cowboy. We like that in Arizona, right? Beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, the youngest, the unworthy one, the one who didn't even come to the sacrifice. Anoint him, for this is he. Verse 13, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David. From that day forward, and Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Now check this out. This is the coolest thing about the passage. Because immediately we see a contrast between King David, who is being anointed here, and King Saul, who, in whom we saw degeneration and degeneration into sin and sin and sin. Right? Saul, uh, he was moved by the Holy Spirit on two occasions. Once at Bethel when he was moved by the Spirit to worship God, and once when he was fighting the Ammonites. And the Holy Spirit moved him to unite Israel in the fight against the Ammonites, the treacherous people. And then we didn't see the Holy Spirit move Saul again. Two occasions. Look at the wording here. The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. While Saul was merely moved by the Spirit, had a spiritual experience the Holy Spirit is actually going to abide with David all the days of David's life. From this day forward, the Holy Spirit abides with David. Now, this is not the indwelling that we see in the book of Acts and and moving forward with Christians today. You know, we, we give our lives over to Christ. Christ is Lord. And then we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit indwells us, counsels us, counsels us, moves us to action, guards our steps, sanctifies us, convicts us, encourages us. He is our best friend on this earth, our counselor, our guide. The Holy Spirit is not indwelling David here, but he is abiding with David. Which means that every step David takes is still being guided by the Holy Spirit. When David is given over to sin, it's because the Holy Spirit allows it. The Holy Spirit is abiding there. The Holy Spirit could guard David from sin if the Holy Spirit wants to. But when David is handed over to sin, the Holy Spirit is there and allowing it to happen. When David succeeds, it's the Holy Spirit there. And we wonder why Saul could degenerate into sin after having a spiritual experience. And and David doesn't degenerate into sin, but he is a a man after God's own heart, even though in spite of his sin. The difference is this. One had the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, and one did not. 
And this is why David's reign will be so crucial in establishing Christ's throne on this earth. And as we continue through David's story, through the rest of 1 Samuel, we are, we're just going to see how the Holy Spirit is this abiding presence for David. And we'll keep this fact in mind. The Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit is abiding with David from this day forward. Brothers and sisters, God is, he's alive, first of all. Like, God is alive. And proof that God lives is that God is working all things together. And we, our tendency to complain, to criticize new things and try and hold on to old. And I'm not saying there, there aren't old things that are positive that pass away. Oh, there certainly are. Right? Things that ought to be celebrated. Things that ought to be honored. When God works things together, though, and those things that are positive pass away, we understand that's the providence of God at work. And when new things come, whether positive or negative from our perspective, we understand that's the providence of God working things out. Uh, proof that God lives, proof that our God is alive, is the fact that we live in such a dynamic world dynamic cultures. When cultures change, it's proof that God is alive, right? Even if those cultures are in large part turning away from God and away from Christianity and away from the Bible, the fact that there is any change going on whatsoever, is, it's proof that God is alive. When churches change, when congregations grow and shrink, when we become more mature, or when you know, uh, false churches digress into sin and sin and sin, and that kind of change is going on. When new things are happening at a church, that's proof that God is alive, things to celebrate, because of the simple fact that God is sovereign, and He is providential, and, and he, he leads, He convicts the leaders of the church to go in a certain direction. And if we are to fall, then it is God who is even in charge of that. And God really is in charge of all things. It is God who causes revival in a community by His providence. And it is God who allows there to be a drought for a time for His glory and for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose for their sanctification. When finances are low at a church or in a, or in a household or a business or a charity organization or whatever, it's just because of the providential hand of God. When we succeed, when we are well-to-do, it's just because of God's providence. And all things belong to Him are guided by, are guided by Him. The two things that remain the same through all time, the laws of nature and human vanity. So just the challenge today, brothers and sisters, is for us not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. For us to really trust in God's providence. Uh, man plans and God laughs. You've heard that one. Uh, the text today would affirm that. I don't know about the laughing part. It's more like he takes us like loving children and says, you're not seeing things the way that I've created them. Trust me. I know what I'm doing. Stop trying to figure it out on your own. And that's the challenge for us this morning.